One thing that I really like, but don't get to talk about much, are the Muppets. Specifically, The Muppet Show. It's The Muppet Show with our very special guest star, Mr. Steve Martin! I was pretty young when I got the second season on DVD and damn near wore that thing out rewatching it. Seasons 1 and 3 came later for me, and 4 and 5 never came out on DVD at all, which is my Roman Empire, so please don't come for me. I can't exactly describe what I thought the show was going to be when I first started watching it. Maybe like a serialized Muppet show? I'm not supposed to be the patient. Today you're getting a dose of your own medicine. <laughs> yeah, but my medicine tastes bad. Well, bad taste never bothered you before. <laughs> but I definitely wasn't expecting a variety show. I didn't grow up in the 70s, I had no idea what the variety show format even was, but imagine my surprise when I found myself enjoying the sketches, musical numbers, and backstage plots, and watching the evolution of the characters I knew in the present day happen before my very eyes. It was a sight. Oh, come now, this won't hurt a bit. Oh, it'll hurt this bit if you don't get laughs with it. <laughs> well, I'm not trying to get laughs, I don't want to set a precedent on the show. <laughs> For some context, The Muppet Show was created by Jim Henson, starring his famous puppets called The Muppets. It ran for a total of five seasons and 120 episodes, and was a consistent hit. It won the Emmy Award for Outstanding Variety Program in 1978, and was nominated every year it aired. Instead of going on for like 50 seasons, like Saturday Night Live, Henson and co. let the show finish on their own terms, and at the top of its game. What is left behind is a time capsule of 70s pop culture. The world is like an apple whirling silently in space, just like the circles that you find there in the windmill of your mind. But also instances that stand the test of time. Now then, hiya, hiya, hiya. You're a wonderful looking audience. It's a pleasure to be here. Good I'm grief, the comedians are there. <laughs> <laughs> you just said here. That was the wrong here. Which is the right here? The other here. Sure. <laughs> go, go, go. The musical numbers that harken back to Golden Era Hollywood or vaudeville are timeless, and a lot of the comedy sketches don't ground themselves in 70s pop culture, and thus are still enjoyable today. Something that I find interesting is that, early in the show's run, mostly season 1 and a bit into season 2, Henson found it difficult to find guest stars for the episodes, sometimes even calling in personal favors. This all changed when Elton John and Rudolf Nureyev hosted the show, and they never had an issue booking a guest star going forward. And you might think, oh, a lesser guest star would mean a lesser episode with lesser material. But that is not the case. The quality of the show stayed consistent throughout its run, even in season one when things were looser and the main cast was still getting figured out. The structure of almost any episode of the show, barring season one, is the cold open, opening musical number, backstage plot, some sketches, more backstage plot, the UK spot, a number specifically shown in the UK due to the less stringent broadcast times over there, more sketches, backstage plot resolution, and then the final curtain call. The tone of these sketches and plots and musical numbers remains also pretty consistent, but when something more tender or sincere does happen, it sure stands out. One early episode, I think, stands above the rest of not only season one, but of the entire show. And that is Season 1, Episode 8, Paul Williams. It's The Muppet Show with our special guest star, Mr. Paul Williams! So the first thing to note is how at home Williams looks among the puppets. Listen, Paul, I just want to say what a real thrill it is to have you on the show. Yeah, that's very kind of you, Kermit. Thank you. Yeah, and you know what? You're not going to hear any jokes about your being little bitty and small and cute and all that sort of thing like you are. You're not going to hear that coming from me. You promise? No. That's little guys got to stick together. Like that of a good host, he goes all in, and it helps his performance style really gels with the Muppets, too. You got anything cheaper? 
Yeah, I can send you to Pittsburgh's standing room only on a broken down old bus for about 75 bucks. Uh, you got anything cheaper? His willingness to crack jokes about his height. I have a special reason for being very excited. You see, except for me, the entire cast is Muppets. Mm, Muppets are little tiny things. And for the first time in my life, no one will make jokes about how short I am. For the first time in my life, I am the tallest person on the show. And his little pat on the shoulder for Ralph at the end, he is really into this. This was the first collaboration between Williams and the Muppets, which would go on to continue for years and yielded some really great work. Williams scored and wrote the songs for the Muppets' first theatrical film, The Muppet Movie, which garnered him an Oscar nomination for his song, The Rainbow Connection, which I'm not going to play here because Disney be damned. He made cameos in various projects in the following decades. The backstage plot for this episode is propped up by Fozzie Bear and Scooter. Fozzie is having a crisis with his jokes on the War of 1812, which he knows are going to flop. Now is no time to panic. Oh, well, see, I, I got 10 minutes of jokes here in the War of 1812. Now is the time to panic. Uh. Scooter suggests that they do the old telephone pole bit, but the gag is that they have to perform it together, with Fozzie as the telephone pole. I, I work alone. I tell the jokes on stage alone. <laughs> no, 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 you don't tell jokes in the telephone pole bit. Why not? Well, you're the telephone pole. <laughs> cute, cute idea. He takes some persuading, but Fozzie really commits to the bit, and the build-up to the joke is very entertaining, really leaves you with a sense of wonder. I am too talented for my own good. <laughs> Will you please? But when the punchline comes, it's like... What the hell are you talking about? Hello, and what's your name? Mike Osnowitzki. Oh, so you're the telephone pole. <laughs> See, pole is meant to be taken like someone who heralds from Poland. A pole. Osnowitzki is a Polish sounding last name. Ha ha ha. The joke is that the joke is intentionally dissatisfying and dumb. And if I had a qualm with anything, it's how the joke does kind of land with a thud. And maybe a better Statler and Waldorf quip to button it could have helped, but the writing doesn't spoil the rest of this episode. Uh, good old Fozzie. He's never been better. Or shorter. Same difference. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite aspects of the show, and one this episode definitely exemplifies, is the sheer amount of characters that populate the world of the Muppets. No one really dominates this episode, so the wealth is shared amongst pretty much everyone who was around at the time. We get appearances from the famous favorites like Kermit, Fozzie, Miss Piggy, Gonzo, etc. But we also get to see obscure characters like Thog and Mary Louise and Hilda the Laundress and George the Janitor. Several background Muppets appear too and just help the world feel so large and lived in. Like a random encounter can happen with anyone or anything at any time. We also get to see two Muppet doppelgangers of Williams, a relatively rare event in the world of The Muppet Show. Dr. Benson Honeydew makes his first appearance, notably without his assistant Beaker, who would be created for season two. Fran Brill, who performs Mary Louise, did her first of ultimately two episodes of the show. I know they'll turn out neat. They'll be great looking puzzle. Have my face great swimmers because they'll have his feet. Kermit's nephew, Robin, also appears for the first time as a member of the ensemble in the show's UK spot. So there's a level of exclusivity to the episode that rings true with so many firsts and onlys. And finally, I want to talk about the sketches and the musical numbers. Of the sketches, the strongest one is the travel agent bit with Williams and Beautiful Day Monster. The escalation of the joke works, and the punchline is extreme in a Muppety kind of way. You got anything cheaper? Yeah, I think I can work something out for you, pal. The others are also fun and are buoyed by William's presence. 
Ralph's poem about silence is constantly interrupted by the literal things he's reading about. Again, good setup and payoff. Will you all get out of here? <laughs> the recurring sketch at the dance is just an excuse to rattle off some pretty awful jokes. <sighs> I'll be darned. You say that's your boy? Huh, how could you have a son that age? Huh, I didn't. When I had him, he was just a baby. <laughs> and the first Muppet Lab sketch is a pretty good indicator of what is to come to be expected from that sketch. Oh, it sets me all a quiver. <laughs> the only real dud of the bunch is the Muppet Houses, which thankfully didn't get past season one and only has a handful of examples. My mother is very religious. She's a fanatic? No, she's a church. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! The musical numbers, though, are where this show really shines. There are four, technically five, but I don't really count Wayne and Wanda, and all are great. The first, a rendition of All of Me, features a generic monster tearing themselves apart to give those pieces to their lover. Next, William sings old-fashioned love songs surrounded by his doppelgangers and the Jug Band. This version of the song really moves, and I think it is better than the version on his album of the same name. And it's not really funny per se, but it is a great time, and Williams is clearly having fun. The most bizarre is the UK spot. I'm in love with a big blue frog. A big blue frog loves me. I'm in love with a big blue frog, first performed by Peter, Paul, and Mary in 1967. The instrumentation, these ghastly synthesizers, is the first thing you hear coming back from commercial, and while strange, really gets going once Mary Louise starts singing. And the novelty song does have a pretty strong punchline. But it's better than the bow I had last year when I loved a little bumblebee. Oh yeah! Love, 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 Finally, the episode closes with Sad Song, also by Williams. The song features no audience reaction throughout, due to its somber tone. The show didn't play with tone very often, but when it did, these moments really stick out. That's a sad song that used to be our song, the one you just played. I wonder if I'd stay. What we'd be doing now. This version is also, I think, an improvement over the original. Paired down instrumentation, the addition of saxophone, the slightly faster tempo, all add to a moment of culmination that really hits home. That's a sad song that used to be our song. And oh, she sang it too. The lyrics, too, really embody Williams and Henson's sensibilities on giving back to the world. When I ran off chasing visions, my emotions made me blind. Like a fool I left behind an angel's glow. So while it's not a Harry Belafonte singing turn the world around kind of magic, it still acknowledges sadness and melancholy are okay feelings to experience, and our growth as people is what makes us human. Come and sing my The 
Paul Williams episode is great as an early triumph for the show. Everyone gets a chance to shine, the music is chosen and performed well, the guest star is natural with the Muppets, and the final musical number gives you something to chew on. What more could you ask for on a weekly outing of a silly variety show?